Hi Anna, my name's Tim. Please excuse me reading from my script. I have to, otherwise I get so angry I go off at tangents. I own a small cab company of around 30 vehicles. When news of this pandemic hit, I was alarmed. Where was this panic suddenly coming from? We were hit with the scaremongering projections of what at that time was still coronavirus was going to do. The government hit us with Neil Ferguson and Imperial College's apocalyptic death expectations. Researchers from the university warned 510,000 people could die from the virus if no action was taken. And had the government stuck with their strategy of trying to mitigate the spread, allowing it to continue but attempting to slow it down with limited measures, such as home isolation, they said this number would roughly be half to 260,000. On the back of this, Boris panicked. He handed the reins to Hancock, or so we are led to believe, except that the government had already downgraded the category of this virus on the 19th of March 2020, a full four days before declaring lockdown, saying COVID-19 is no longer considered to be a high consequence infectious disease in the UK, a fact which is still posted today on their website. I seem to remember the name Ferguson, so I researched him. He was the same professor who made model predictions in 2001 for the foot and mouth disease, influencing government policy, causing the slaughter of six million cattle, sheep and pigs, even if there was no evidence of any infection. Michael Thursfeld, the professor of veterinary epidemiology, said that the model was severely flawed and made serious errors. In 2002, he also predicted that up to 50,000 people would likely die from exposure to mad cow disease, or BSE, adding a caveat that it could rise to 150,000 if there was a sheep epidemic too. In the UK, there have only been 177 deaths from BSE. In 2005, Ferguson again said that up to 200 million people could be killed from bird flu. He told The Guardian that 40 million people had died from Spanish flu and there are six times the population now, so you could scale it up to around 200 million, probably. In the end, 282 people died worldwide from the disease. In 2009, the same team predicted that swine flu had a case fatality of 0.3% to 1.5%, with his most likely estimate being 0.4%. Based on Ferguson's advice, the government had estimated the disease would lead to 65,000 deaths in the UK. In the end, swine flu killed 457 people in the UK, with a death rate of just 0.026% of those infected. So, as you can see, his track record was worse than abysmal. Yet, here were our government taking his word as gospel. No peer review. No thought to the recklessness of previous claims. This report was then also taken by Fauci to the American president. So I marvelled at how two great Western powers were trusting a proven failure to facilitate the handling of the crisis. It didn't make sense. Now I was hooked. I'm a big believer in that if it looks like a duck, waddles like a duck and quacks like a duck, there's good odds that it's a duck. I watched as what at the time seemed to be mass hysteria from mainstream media and the government propaganda machine kicked into full swing. Headlines surfaced daily, such as NHS facing its biggest crisis ever, we need to work to save the people, we need to work together, etc, etc. I watched Boris's first briefing on March the 20th. I noticed how they used classic mind manipulation trickery. It was very subtle at first. The government came out with slogans that seemed harmless initially. It was keep your distance, wash your hand, think of others. This became, quickly, stay at home, save lives, protect the NHS. The rhythm and pattern of these is not by accident. In psychology, it's known as omnitrium perfectum, or more commonly as the rule of three. If you are not sure, Google it. It's to subliminally hit those that are most susceptible. It doesn't work on everyone, much as Darren Brown picks who he is able to control. But it's a very, very powerful tool when used en masse. 
The government then began to repeat these mantras at every possible point, and they were displayed at every briefing. Any hypnotherapist will tell you that if phrases are repeated often enough, the words become implanted in our subconscious mind. It's called also auto-suggestion. The signage auto -su auto also subtly switched from plain white signs to yellow ones with red hash marks. This was also by design. Again, ask anyone with knowledge. Yellow and red signs are used to instill a feeling of danger. Surely, if the virus was so deadly, it would be self-evident. We wouldn't need to have any fear instilled. Then, every day, the mainstream media had massive headlines about death totals. A lot of this relying on the fact that so many people have no idea that on average around 1,700 people die every day in the UK. So when these figures came out, people panicked. Huge figures every day. Another 100, another 500. Protect the NHS became the mantra. People decided on a clap for the NHS, which the government and mainstream media quickly hijacked. People felt obliged to stand on the doorstep every week at 8 o'clock to clap the NHS. It was a masterstroke by the government. They were getting people to virtue signal to others. If you don't clap, you don't care, etc. Think about that for a second. Protect the NHS. The very organisation whose remit is to protect us. We're actually advocating sick people stay away from hospitals. This swiftly stopped being endorsed by the government once the doctors and nurses, wearing the supposed short supply PPE, started to make a plethora of dance and TikTok videos. On one hand, the government was stopping people using hospitals because they were supposedly so busy. On the other hand, the nurses were so bored they had time and energy to make all these videos. They had to call an end to the clapping before the tide turned completely. It was even announced on HSJ on April the 13th. Remember, that was the height of the death tolls, that nationwide the hospitals had four times as many empty beds as normal. In fact, the NHS operational dashboard showed 37,500 general acute beds were unoccupied. Yet people needing treatment were told to stay at home. Indeed, many hospitals were empty. My own local one closed all bar one ward, which had 11 people in, none of them from the virus. When they realised they had killed the NHS as a virtue signal, the rule of three mantra changed again to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Eschewing an aura of old East Germany, trying to turn neighbour on neighbour, classic divide and conquer, if we are fighting between ourselves, we are far easier to control. The scaremongering was then ramped up even more. Glaring death toll headlines. More features to the virus now. Lack of sense of smell could signify the virus. Then, to coincide with the racism rhetoric, BAME people were suddenly more at risk than, than... And then people over six feet tall became more susceptible. They then began categorising groups most at risk. Taxi drivers were head of that list. Then days ago, Fauci advocated the wearing of goggles along with masks. All this after the supposed cataclysmic virus has all but disappeared. We stand here day after day, listen to the rhetoric coming from the government. It changes almost daily. Indeed, every member of the government daily briefing team stated there was no evidence for the benefit of wearing masks. Jonathan Van Tam even went so far to say he'd been studying it for 15 years and there was nothing to support it. Yet amazingly, within weeks of that statement, masks became compulsory. What happened in the four weeks that didn't show up in the previous 15 years, Jonathan? The government lies became more obvious as people started questioning. All of a sudden, Boris claimed he, he didn't tell the schools to close, he only advised it. Is that just a clever wriggle designed to be able to deflect blame at a later date? PHE then also came out admitting they were falsifying the reports of death from CB19. A day or so later, Hancock came out admitted reports of infections were grossly exaggerated. How are these people still in power with such blatant manipulation of the facts? The mind games continued. The government then very kindly opened up slightly. The purpose of this was to make the oppressed people feel grateful to the oppressors. It also served as another attempt at dividing the people as there were still undertones that it could be catastrophic. This culminated with local lockdowns in a few places. 
another classic mind game to make the majority feel they had to toe the line or they could suffer the same fate. Most people don't realise that Leicester was locked down because, in Hancock's own words, their seven-day infection rate was 135 cases per 100,000. Remember, this is cases, not deaths. This is cases he has already admitted are being falsely recorded. Just when you think the government can stoop no lower, this afternoon they announced that the North East, sorry, North West, was to be newly restricted. The newly restricted areas have a total population of 4,479,135. That's five infections per 100,000. Bear in mind, this figure is arrived at after the testing has been ramped up and the tests are for corona. No mention of severity or even if they were symptomatic. As deaths have declined rapidly, even allowing for the false recording, the government realised that project fear was waning. They needed to step it up again. Note how the rhetoric changed almost overnight, from deaths to cases, from COVID-19 to corona. This was no accident, this was by design. The government can't control the death figures, they can, however, control the case figures. They think we're stupid. They test more people and then claim, horror of horrors, that there are more positives. No shit, Sherlock. But people fall for it, so much so that they welcome the command to wear masks while shopping, despite the fact that during the height of the scandemic, no one was wearing a mask while shopping and no spike came in the retail sector. Despite the fact they claimed it was such a necessity for you to wear them, but then gave you 10 days before it became law. Despite the fact that there was no definitive type of mask you should wear. Put an onion bag around your chops and it'll suffice. Despite the fact that there were variants of people wearing masks, which even the manuf manufacturer tells you are no use against viruses. Or even people pulling the t-shirt up over the chin. Why can these people not see it's not about health, it's about compliance? If the government really believed in what they were telling you, there would be the equivalent of gas masks used in the Second World War, not soggy face nappies. For six weeks now, deaths have been below the 10-year average never mind below a pandemic projection. Deaths because of lockdown are overtaking deaths they attributed to the virus. Doctors are crying out about the rates of suicide. Doctors are crying out about the damage caused to cancer sufferers. These deaths are all firmly laid at the feet of Hancock and Johnson. Whether they are being controlled by others or not, they are the ones we voted for and they are ones fronting the tyranny. Can no one see the speed with which these doctors came out to question the whole debacle are censored and deleted. It shows how scared the governments are. Goebbels, Hitler's propagandist, once said, if you repeat the lie often enough, people will start to believe it. And if you want to control the population and you have to deal with an opposition, you should accuse the opposition of the trickery which you yourself are using. Which is why these doctors are being censored. If what these doctors are saying is so untrue, would it not make far more sense to publish facts that unequivocally prove it rather than censor them? Do the math. I've fought this tyranny from day one, but I get tired. I try to point out the myriad, myriad of facts at my disposal, only for people to return with the, you're wrong. No argument, just that statement. One lady, bless her, who had been so scared, she seriously believed that without masks, 3.9 billion people were going to die. When I asked her where she got that figure, she said that I had no idea about math and that the population of the Earth is 780 billion and 0.5% were going to die from the virus. She went on to say that I was not aware that 100 million was a billion. This is the problem. We are fighting against ill-informed people who believe mainstream media is the gospel. I'd made my, made my mind up to leave Twitter. The constant banging of my head on a brick wall was taking its toll. But then last week, my eldest daughter sent me a picture. A tiny, pudgy, gloriously beautiful hand. Hiding an equally adorable face. My youngest grandson. She sent it not for any other reason than she thought I'd love it. I did, of course. And then I realised, 
I can't give up fighting this. We've got to carry on. Normally I'd never do something like this video, man. But for the sake of my two gloriously wonderful grandsons, I've got to try. I can't live with myself knowing that I have not tried every avenue to secure the safety from tyranny for these two little boys who can't defend themselves. Thanks for the platform, Anna. I'd like to leave you all with this thoughts attributed to Mark Twain. It's easier to fool people than to convince them they've been fooled. And a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes.